This is the Cinematography for Actors podcast. More than a podcast, Cinematography for Actors is a vibrant community devoted to bridging the gap between talent and crew. Each week, our show offers transparent, insightful conversations with industry leaders. We unveil the magic behind the scenes from candid discussions about unique filmmaking processes to in-depth technical exploration. Join us in unraveling the intricacies of filmmaking one episode at a time. It's more than just cameras and lenses. We aim to inspire, educate, and empower as we peel back the curtain on the art of effective storytelling. Now on to the episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinematography for Actors podcast. It is just Indiana today. Haley is um, at some hospital for the her birth of a fr- like her friend's baby. So, you know, it's just us, uh, Sam here, um, Sam Messman from OWC and We Make Movies. Uh, and I'm really excited to kind of dive in today to a little bit about um, how Sam is changing our industry for the better and making it easier to make films and have your voice heard in filmmaking. So thank you, Sam, for coming. Welcome to CFA Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited. Uh, this is going to be fun. So I like to, I very much prefer um, drive. Go. I'm excited. Let's go. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, so Sam, Cinematography for Actors, and you're familiar with us because we've done two kind of interviews with you at OWC, which I'll, I'll kind of start mm-hmm. off with. And that was at NAB. Um, and we did a great NAB roundup episode um, just to kind of like brief people who didn't know what NAB was and how valuable it can be for insight and education around the industry. So we did something there. And then we recently met up at Cinegear, which was back on the Paramount lot. And it was it was awesome. The sun came out and the June bloom went away. Um, and so I saw you both at the OWC booth. And so what is OWC or the head of marketing there? I am the head of marketing there. And you catch me with my full nerd hat on, Love you know, that. there, which is basically, but in the end, right, you know, this is, we are a creative technology for creative people. And a lot of it is um, whether people want to admit it or not, you know, they need certain tools and infrastructure in order to create content. And, mm-hmm. you know, the the big analogy we like to use is, you know, you could have a race car or a spaceship or something, and you can have the most expensive spaceship imaginable, and it can go a million miles an hour, or go at the speed of light. Um, but the problem is, if there is one cable in there that is not operating in the right way or there's a piece of of gear it does not matter how fast your spaceship can go right it'll go at the speed of that one cable or uh at that one connection and at owc what we try and do is think through people's solutions and workflows um so that uh they don't stare at spinning beach balls while they're trying to create because those things um more or less ruin the experience of creating. And I like can't tell you, and it all comes from a place of honestly, I'm a filmmaker myself and just being forced to sit there and try and make a movie with um, gear that is not designed to work together. And then the aggravation of just like, well, I thought this was supposed to work. Why is there a problem here? What's like, what's the problem? You know, like that is the, I think the entire mission of our company is to, to make that feeling go away. That's cool. And as for, I mean, that's something I think a lot of us struggle with because not only is it like, how do you kind of get organized in our world around kind of having the right cables with you or like streamlining the process as much as you can. Um, I think that's kind of one of the biggest challenges, at least I'm having and maybe projecting onto everyone else. Um, But for OWC, you guys have different layers of involvement based off of what kind of scale of filmmaking you're approaching. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how from the solo filmmaker on the go, you have application there versus kind of a larger, you know, DIT carts and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the reality is there's just different types of creators now. You might have an influencer who just needs a little tiny hard drive and it's got to be something portable that's on the go and it needs to not break and it needs to be fast enough to do 4K video and, and all that. And then you might also be a DIT who gets paid a thousand dollars a day to handle the uh moving 20 terabytes of media a day on a high-end Marvel movie that's got you know 
endless the cast of thousands and is going to have a giant vfx workflows and then is going to go into post-production at a movie studio that's going to have a team of editors and vfx people working on it and it's two very different ways of making content you know and this is and then there's endless others you know you could be a school that needs a, a mac lab that's going to have a bunch of people make content that way or you're an independent filmmaker who just needs basically a four bay hard drive and is going to connect in through like, and it's a one man band sort of thing, you know, and that's like, there's just so many different perspectives, even right down to what you're doing right now, which is a podcast, right? What does the podcast workflow look like? And what, you know, where does that media go and how does that information get captured and then get completed and archived and stored and saved? And what actually makes sense there? What microphones are you hooking up to a dock? what software you're using to record it all of these things it's content right and ideally it's got to be like what's the fastest way to make this and what's the least expensive way to do it you know that's the that's the formula cool that's so awesome the now you did you come on i was reading your bio when we were talking and did you come on because you created the jellyfish yeah that's the so um, we started a computer server company called LumaForge, mm -hmm. uh, I guess seven, eight, ten years ago. I don't know, it's ten, I don't know, it all kind of blends together with yeah, yeah, yeah. we had a few I know. years there that was dull. Um, yeah. but somewhere around like 2013, we started a, a company called LumaForge uh that was designed to make computer servers for video accessible, uh basically dumb enough for people like me to use. And uh we uh made this server the jellyfish and that um eventually we got acquired by owc towards the beginning of the pandemic which is why i'm head of marketing there now because yeah. you know part of what was really interesting to me was like all right we made a anywhere from ten thousand to you know hundred thousand dollar product right that uh meanwhile i know all of these filmmakers and content creators and it's this weird thing of a well, I can help some of you with this product that we made. And, you know, we can have a conversation and solve workflow problems for like a certain number of you. But um, but then there's all these other people that I like working with and that I wanted to reach and, and getting connected into OWC, which makes all of these other products. And right. it just was a lot more interesting uh, in terms of having uh creating solutions for lot for pretty much anybody now that's that's what we're able to do so that was uh why we made the move and uh it's been awesome that's so great the so filmmaker perspective the filmmaker journey of your life are you still doing it while at OWC and what are you are you directing are you producing writing so uh at the moment I've gotten really was it, so we're building actively, we make movies and we actually made uh, three micro budget feature films, I guess, two years ago during the pandemic as part of the make your feature competition uh, uh, that we did. So it was a little bit like Project Greenlight, um, you know, meets Silicon Valley. We got a, a like a, we, we tried to merge Silicon Valley investing and micro budget filmmaking and Project Greenlight and did a whole competition and and did that and so there was three movies that came out of that and on top of that we also have a startup business that is literally solving the problem of insurance uh where basically you have to insurance and production management for independent filmmaking you know basically we do all of the stuff most independent producers don't want to do so and it's a mixture of like getting your SAG paperwork and permitting and do you yeah. need a colorist and basically you come to us and you're like I've got 10 problems uh and the big one that I need is uh they want to charge me you know four to ten thousand dollars for an insurance policy that I don't want to spend for my short film uh can you help me and we can help you and wow. we save you a lot of money on that but then also uh, you know, doing payroll and all these things. It's connected together into, I mean, it's odd, um, but the problem with filmmaking, in my opinion, is there's 9 million things that have nothing to do with filmmaking that mm -hmm. you have to learn in order yes. to make a film. And then you have to learn how to make a film too. And there's just too much stuff for uh, independent 
uh, filmmakers specifically. So what we've tried to do with We Make Movies is um, basically give you the benefit of studio level filmmaking, which is payroll and infrastructure and accounting and being able to get easy rentals and all of this other stuff and, you know, hooking up some deals and all of that. But we don't own your movie. Got it. Got it. And so with We Make Movies, you did you start it? Yeah. So and this, I, yeah. Yeah. How did that happen? Like, yeah. What is like, you have this idea and then you suddenly it's, it's known as an organization. What is that process and journey? So that, <laughs> that process and journey <laughs> is, uh, you make a movie, uh, in like 2007 or 2008 with your buddies, uh, appropriately titled how i got lost uh which was a large independent or well i would say small independent movie uh for that time uh but you know we shot it in new york city and missouri and i found myself in los angeles uh oddly right before uh, right when the writer's strike the last writer's strike hit uh i think it was like 2007 or 2008 and then the financial crisis hit on top of that and i was in a new city in Los Angeles. Um, by the way, pro tip for all of you, uh, during this strike and financial crisis or whatever, at any given time, if you make a movie and you do think you can just transfer your stuff to zero balance credit cards and uh, reduce your debt or or have lots of money you know, uh, that you can spend on your credit card to go, don't do that because they can cut your uh, amount overnight uh, oh. and raise your interest rates and uh and completely kill your cushion and so you're in debt in a new city uh during a financial crisis and a strike which is what happened to me that's prior insane. to starting we oh, make movies my um it was weird i've had a few periods in my life where i don't really remember what happened there or how i necessarily got through it but i do know that uh it was either quit and stop um because the other thing you realize with independent film is like distribution's really really challenging and you have to yeah. build an audience and community around your movie and we learned some of that the hard way we won a whole bunch of awards at festivals and all this other stuff and then in the end uh you know the distribution dance is very very challenging uh so uh it was that lesson of either learn uh and and figure out how you're going to do this with no money broke in a new city um, so we started, the only thing we had were scripts and people we knew. Okay. So we started uh, doing readings in Los Angeles uh, every three months. That's what We Make Movies started as, was people getting together, at unemployed actors, unemployed writers, and just reading people's stuff and trying to get things going. And then over the next 10 years, we had various incarnations, but it was a weekly workshop uh, in Los Angeles, you know, prior to the pandemic. We still are doing it but like it was during the pandemic which was its initial phase where we literally had thousands of projects come through the workshop we made wow. hundreds of uh movies all different types of things from features to shorts to we did a long-running youtube studio sketch series when youtube studios first came out like we did web series everything you know we have we've had our own film festival for a bunch of years so it's really been about making content um, this entire time because that's all I wanted to be was an independent filmmaker. So, you know, working your way through Hollywood can be challenging. So I sort of made my own Hollywood. And now it's a business um, that tries to streamline um, filmmaking for people so they have fewer problems as they're trying to make their content. And in the big picture, you know, the the goal is to gradually merge those two aspects, which is the community aspect, which we're really, which has always been the thing that's been most important to us with the like business side, which is how do you approach filmmaking in the climate like this uh, yeah. in a practical way and not lose it every dollar you have? My goodness. Yeah, CFA, I mean, we always say like the community is the most important thing for us just because the reason we get into film is to be collaborative and to work with other talented individuals. And so it's really interesting to hear that um, when We Make Movies started, you you had just like groups of people coming together to read scripts. 
um, and and kind of put on projects. So how were you, you came to LA, where are you from originally? Uh, Jersey originally, and cool. then I was in, uh, I went to school in New York and uh, was in New York for about 10 years. And then we made the movie and started in New York and shot some in St. Louis and then ended up here in LA and then was in LA for like 12 years. Uh, I spent the pandemic. I'm still technically in Philadelphia. And then we're in Atlanta next year. Uh, cool. And so it's just, yeah, that's, that's been what the migration is, is Amazing. Been looking like. When you moved to LA then coming from New York, you had already kind of built a community or what was that like building process looking like for your own personal network? Yeah, I mean, we got out of school and we started, you know, uh, my first job uh, out of college was uh, Times Square Applebee's in New York. Actually, it was okay. the Applebee's in my uh, hometown. And I transferred to the Times Square Applebee's in cool. New York. And then uh, that was the prestigious first job while we sort of tried to make movies on the side and make our own content. We had our own little film collective and we would put on these screenings and and do stuff and then uh we got a grant for this feature film and then we're able was able to raise some money on top of that for the independent feature i made a boxing documentary somewhere along the line uh in new york and then uh that eventually uh led to the independent feature and we had we were working with this uh theater collective um called The Collective, actually, out of New York, uh, right. and oddly started, or Amy Schumer was actually uh, in that uh, for a while, and uh, there's a bunch of people in her shows that are all from that little uh, theater collective, and I saw this, and we we ran our movies through that, and um, for readings, and it was really helpful for the scripts, and so we sort of duplicated that blueprint when we started We Make Movies uh, in Los Angeles. And so it was based on sort of, I guess, a community that we had in New York, and we wanted that same type of community in Los Angeles. And that was the closest approximation we had, which was the collective in New York. And then uh, we kind of put our own spin on it because they were more interested in theater, and we just adapted it for filmmaking and and what we were doing uh you know for because they're really LA as you probably know is a little hard on the community side so you know that's the other thing I'm not great at networking so this was my way of networking too yeah just to start the community yourself because then everyone yeah. comes to you rather than you having to individually go to them in a way right I mean it is more efficient yeah it is I gotta be the way, how would you find people when you were in LA to build this out? Was it just kind of like word of mouth and like, oh, I know that person from New York, they're going to bring three people, kind of stuff like that, like domino effect? So the the best way that I found uh, to do networking is to not make it about you. So yeah. the the big thing that you do, right, The and this is the easiest thing in, in anything is like, so you want to start a film festival, you want to do a screening, right? You can say, okay, everyone come see my movie and I'm going to do this and, and do it that way. Or you can say, oh, you're a writer, you're a writer, you're a writer. What if I run a theater for a night? And, uh, and you know a bunch of actors, right? So there's how many parts in your movie? And okay, so we need people to play each of these parts and we need people to play all the parts in the other script. You take 15 pages out of each of them. And then suddenly you've got 50 people in a room and then you have a break and you give out some free wine and stuff. And you see what yeah. happens. It's always the free wine that I think really yeah. solidifies the deal in LA as well. So that's wonderful. We have some exciting news. CFA has teamed up with We Make Movies to get you a discount on production management services, including access to comprehensive production insurance and workers' comp for your next shoot. Visit WeMakeMovies.org slash insurance and use code CFA23 on your intake form for 10% off your quote. The, do you still have that format of events with We Make Movies? Yeah, so we're we're down to, we're monthly at the moment, uh, just because Aubrey and I are not uh, in LA right now. So we're keep, we, we're keeping the community, going. we've even got it going in New York now as well. Cool. Uh, and it's been weird since the pandemic. We haven't quite, we've changed the format of them, but um, we have not, 
completely figured out how people want the live events to work and what the community really needs to look like. So it's not weekly like it was before the pandemic. It's more monthly, so it feels a little bit more special at yeah. the moment just because people are still weird about going out. And, you know, it's like, so we found that monthly is a little bit better than weekly at the moment for mm -hmm. the events. Uh, but yeah, it's still going. We're They're over. And also, you know, the entire landscape of Los Angeles has changed a little bit too. So it's, um, but it's still fundamentally the same thing, which is getting a bunch of projects together and you're going to get 50 to 100 people into uh, a theater in Los Angeles and you're going to get people talking and you're going to get people collaborating. And based on that, they're going to make content. And that's the thing that we've been doing, you know, for 12, 13 years, when we get down to Atlanta, we're get, we're going to do the same thing there. And it's, it's that really, it's that concept of, um, I've also found that like, if you go to a networking function and it's called a networking function, you rarely talk to anybody because you're all just like, I don't have a prompt to talk to them about. But if you're at a community event and you're going to read a script or you're going to watch somebody's short film or something you have, or it's about filmmaking and there's a panel, you're going to have an icebreaker to talk to somebody yes. ab about yeah. that'll be that'll more likely lead to conversation and then you start seeing the same people show up on a weekly or monthly basis and then that's how you you sort of build friendships and relationships which is kind of what we did with we make movies you know so we lived in our own little world there but it was uh it was fun you know yeah. and we we met tons of people and we made loads of projects with people because everybody comes in and they're like, okay, I know how to make this part and I got this part of my movie under control, but I need help with these five other things that I don't have under control. Does anybody know anybody? And it turns into people referring people onto various projects and that leads to a lot of healthy collaborations. That's wonderful. Yeah, I I always say that I do terrible at house parties, but I do really well at networking or community events because at house parties you're going up to people not knowing what that thorough line is of like what you can have a basis to get started on it as you've said like the icebreaker but whenever I'm at like networking events you know that like at least you can just talk about film if you wanted to so it's just like it makes it a lot easier because you just have that shared passion and and so I think that's just so wonderful with the we make movies community I mean I know you're doing you said you're doing in LA New York soon to be Atlanta kind of what numbers are you looking at like how um how what's your membership like i mean it depends on how you look at it you know like in terms of membership you know like uh it could be anywhere i mean it's it's thousands technically you know uh how active is all of it? i mean we have a large instagram like we have but you know that and we have you know hundreds if not thousands of customers that are coming through regularly through the business um and then it's all the people coming through the workshops so i don't know is a sort of uh and it, it, it depends and it's like through what lens i mean if i had yes. to add up all the people who've read at a we make movies event over the last you know 10, yeah. 15 years it's thousands and thousands of beautiful them, you know wow. uh and how many people have made movies and have gotten together and done stuff and and made things thousands you know like active participants and typically we'll have anywhere from 50 to 100 uh at any given workshop and then we have the online workshops and then we have our customers and then we have you know and and so and then there's the social conversation and and that's so it's all a long way of saying i don't know that's wonderful sure. though that's very cool for the we make movies kind of customer base so if someone, is it the majority is going through for the insurance or is it kind of the connections on like, I need a colorist or I need, you know, someone to do this kind of what is the main thing that people are like, solve this problem for me. So most people come in literally being like, I heard you can solve my insurance problems. I have nice. this thing. I need to do this thing. Like I heard you can get me cheap insurance and solve my problems. And then they find out oh, but you can also, oh, wow, so you're going to manage my payroll and, oh, I can do permitting for you guys and what, you can do my SAG paperwork. I don't want to do my SAG paperwork. So you can yeah. do that for me. And like, there's all these, they find out and then they're like, oh, do you have recommendations on this and and a host of other things? So 
but they typically it gets passed around that we are hands down the best deal in town for insurance and we have a little bit of a unique makeup that allows us to do that um and then uh and then it sort of unwinds from there in terms of what people want to do uh but primarily it's it's production management you know which it's insurance that leads to the production management side uh where you're going to get a um very above board well run production uh that is handled accounting wise properly and uh is properly insured, et cetera, all the things that you'd sort of want from a studio production, but you know, it's an independent production. And for like, if I was to come as an actor and I wanted to kind of make my own film, but I didn't know anyone, would you even be able to help with like crewing up and things like that? Yeah, no, we took know tons of people. So that's the thing. If you're like, Hey, do you know, give me some people this way. It's like, okay, yeah. I mean, that's, we have that Rolodex in place. So, and a lot of it'll be like, well, who are you, who are you interested in? Like, what are you interested in and how do you want this to work? And, and, and that's sort of how we make recommendations, but yeah, there's, there's people who know people and it's, it's all kind of a internal referral system. Once we kind of know project scope budget, because the, the thing is, um, not every referral is equal. So a lot of it will be like, okay, What's your rate? Yeah. What are you looking to offer? Because that will then allow us to be like, oh, well, that person's not going to do it. But these these people are, 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 you know, at that part of their journey. And that's going to, this project will make more sense for them. Or in terms of sensibility to, you know, uh, there'll be different types of crew people who will collaborate differently. So yeah, there's, there's a whole uh, matrix to it. Now I have, if you aren't doing this, I have a suggestion of what to add because I found this with a lot of the directors I work with for like short film when you're talking about distribution or like festival runs is like, do you have already in place someone who comes on and goes, this is the kind of movie you've made, this genre, this length, this content, it can go to these festivals, like send, in, send it to these festivals because I find film freeway, you know, you just have so many festivals you can apply to. And I think for newer directors, it's harder to like get in there and understand where to apply or where to spend that money or allocate the budget. So film festivals, uh, what I would ask people really is what are you hoping happens from submitting to a film festival? What is your goal? What mm -hmm. And that, will really help answer the question in terms of which ones to apply to and why you're applying to. Because uh, if it's to get distribution, there's only five and you're not likely to get into any of them. So that's, you know, that's one aspect of it. If it's to attend uh, and have a really high quality screening with friends and family or go to a location and possibly get paid to come out there and do some of that, or, or at least, you know, have an experience as a filmmaker, then like there's a whole other second tier that deliver a very high quality theatrical experience and have communities around them that take care of people. And like, you're gonna get to, like, you'll get to visit someplace and do it. Or if it's to have an LA screening, you know, which is that you can pack out with, you know, properly that feels substantial around your project, then that's another reason to do it. So, you know, everybody's, it starts first though, from asking the question of like, okay, why do I think I need to be in a film festival? Yeah. And then you're going to have different tiers that will make sense based on that. Um, but you can, a lot of filmmakers spend insane amounts of money insane. on festival applications. And they unfortunately don't even really know why they're spending it in a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah, I found that it's kind of like a lot of people also don't allocate that in the budget. So they have no clue for when like how much money they're actually going to be spending. Um, and then they're kind of like two, three grand in for a short film that they've only spent, you know, a couple of thousand dollars on. Um, and so it's kind of like, I feel like I haven't found the guide yet to give to people when they ask like, what festivals would you recommend? And so um, Film Freeway just feels like a lot sometimes. So that's good. Yeah. Well, it is a lot. And there's also a lot of them are scams, you know, and yeah. Um, and they don't actually really care about filmmakers. Like we run our own uh, film festival, which is WM International. And cool. uh, we, uh, we at the very least, we make it, uh, it's a fun fit film festival to attend. You're going to come in, you're going to meet people. Uh, we really 
make it, you know, it's by filmmakers for filmmakers. I'm not promising you that you're going to necessarily get a career in filmmaking by having your um, film premiere there, but uh, we're very well reviewed because we really try and create a great experience for filmmakers attending there and making them feel valued, which is unfortunately does not happen uh, a lot in the film festival circuit. So uh, Film Freeway is all over the map though. And uh, the best thing to do was ask filmmakers what their experiences have been at various places. And honestly, if you don't know someone who's had their film screened at this festival, um, probably don't submit, you know? And yeah. like, it, it's like, honestly, it's it can be that simple in terms of paring it down the weird thing for people is I think there's this pressure to like be in a lot of festivals and your movies only justified if you uh, do it in a certain way. And I would, I would disrupt that notion and simply say, there's a lot of ways to the same place and your film festival success, you know, there's a lot of ways to have screenings for your movie. I would yeah. say. Okay, we are stoked to shout out our audio sponsor, Deity Microphones. Their S Mic 2 Pro shotgun mics have impeccable sound clarity, directionality, headphone monitoring, and a user friendly design. And we're proud to launch our studio with them. Our goal is to bring you educational gems every episode. And with these mics, you can listen to the best quality audio possible wherever you are. To learn more about using Deity Mics for your own podcasting, voiceover, or filming needs, go to deitymic.com. Um, pivoting a little to kind of the current state of our industry, um, the technical side of things. So like I said, we ran into each other at NAB and Cinegear, and I got to talk with you um, when Haley was with me. And, and so you're kind of at those conferences and trade shows um, at a different capacity because you're obviously at the booth and people are stopping to you rather than kind of going around to every booth. Um, what are you like seeing is the most kind of, what are the biggest challenges people are having in the technical field at the moment? Um, or especially like what OWC is trying to tackle? Like, you know, you have talks about virtual production and things like that, of course, but are there things people keep coming to you with that you're seeing a pattern? So at the very least, I mean, here's what I see with YouTube creators and influencers and people who are, there's there's kind of two tracks, right? There's people who are trying to get up the industry track, right? And that's one uh, way to go and climb that ladder. And then there's another track that is, I launched a YouTube channel, I'm making content, and I figured out a few different ways with, you know, bubblegum and duct tape how to do this, but I want to now figure out the right way to do stuff. And uh, whereas on the industry side, it's like they kind of know the right way. In fact, in a lot of ways, I call it the AFI method, which is they, in order to make a film, I need uh, a cast of thousands and a giant budget. And I need to, uh, I need all of these things in order to do it. Whereas, uh, and those things aren't wrong, actually. They're, they're totally right in that, like, that is a very high quality way to do it but maybe they have a little bit of a hard time uh, getting their hands dirty and being resourceful. Whereas the the other side only knows how to be resourceful and hasn't really been trained to make content at a high level. And both ways are effective. So one is trying to figure out how to make content cheaper, but maintain a higher level of quality. And the other side is trying to figure out I keep making content and it's not turning out the way that I want it to. And I have all these technical problems and I don't know what the solutions are. Do you make a box that makes it easier for me? And, um, and, and th that's kind of the two paradigms that I sort of see because everyone wants their content to be cheaper and everyone wants to be able to make good looking stuff for less money because budgets are continue to go down. And the other side is, um, then people need to scale content teams. What I see with a lot of influencers is they don't want to be the ones making the content. They all want to hire an editor so yeah. that they can yeah. go and be the creative and build the business and do all of this stuff and then have a team manage that. The problem is uh, they get frustrated 
when the person they hire doesn't do it the way they did it and then and all of this stuff so scaling a team is is very hard so there's challenges in in either direction which is getting used to a certain level of production and then having to do that for less versus scaling your production from nothing into um you know something that is requires more infrastructure and leveling up yeah talking about like so from cinematography for actors where we you know work a lot with actors and then emerging filmmakers and kind of looking at cross departmental bridging the gap through communication mm -hmm. however for actors you know we're finding especially you know self tapes during the pandemic and things like that that actors are expected to be they were always expected to be their own entrepreneurs but that they are yeah. now having to create their own content or that they're, they're writing more and they're actually trying to make that stuff so from your standpoint, understanding the technical, practical, and creative, um, where where does someone get started from a technical point? So, like, what do they? What would you say saves them, you know, time and all of that stuff, like to get started if they don't, if they're their own DP, if they're their own director as an actor and influencer? Kind of, it could be gear, maybe solutions that you have in mind, or just like a workflow to get started. Okay, so well, and actually, you know, I, I probably should have just rethought my last answer which is um oh i'm coming at it through the cinematography for actors lens right which is i mean here's the thing the reason that you all have to do that right is if you don't you're completely beholden to someone else's image of you and what they think you can do and what they right. think you can play and making all these self-tapes that like uh, are roles that you didn't design and you know it's hard to get seen and so the only way to really show yourself and your talent the way that you want to be able to do that as a producer and look we make movies was built on that that's yeah. that's what all of this is for the most part is actors a lot of what what used to happen in the workshop right is actors would read another people's scripts and they'd be like well, i want to make my own stuff can i bring my own stuff in here and then cool. they'd write their own stuff and they'd start working shopping and then they'd go and try and make a, a movie you know inexpensively and and try and do that and and learn that way and um, and very quickly, it became very obvious that you had to be your own producer and social media following and, 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 and it's literally like, you've got to wear nine hats yeah. just to and learn nine other jobs just to do the job you originally wanted to do. Um, so you want my recommendation for that is, yeah. <laughs> uh, is actually, um, mobile filmmaking and iPhone, iPhone filmmaking. So the best way to do this and the cheapest and easiest way to do this is literally to get together and shoot scenes with a scene partner um, or a couple of other scene partners and practice filming those and, and creating with your iPhone because it's all the same thing fundamentally. You can level up the gear, you can gradually add better sound, but the thing that you can't really teach until you do it is designing a movie in your head Mm -hmm. and then shooting that in the real world with coverage and then editing that together and the problem is a lot of people are like, I need 10,000, I need 20,000, I need $50,000 right. to make a movie. It's the worst thing you can do. Do not do that. Fail horribly at first, inexpensively with your iPhone. Uh, do not spend any money on your first five movies just so that you understand the process so you don't get angry at your editor because they didn't invent shots you didn't shoot. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and all of these things like- we've like, all been there yeah making movies that you did like all of the problems are like trying to shoot you know 12 pages in a day and wondering why things don't look perfect when it comes out like all there's so many rookie mistakes that you can just get out of the way by like just simply sitting down and, and making very basic movies with your friends and yeah. just going through the process and understanding the process and then when you under the key to directing is like you have to understand what everyone else's job is and the only way to do this and is to fail quickly and and go through and fail as quickly and cheaply as possible and that's really what iPhone filmmaking allows you to do uh is basically take all of this get it in wash it through the process and be like okay I did that I don't really like how that came out I bet I could use a nicer camera or I could have these things but I can mimic the process and do this for practically nothing put uh, something together and then see where I need to level up. You do that a few times, 
you know, one to five times, and then you're probably ready to start paying uh, to do collaborations. And you're probably going to be more advanced producer than most producers, you know, who are actors already are, who directed a larger thing, but it went horribly wrong for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And for the workshops that you guys have, which I think would just be such a fantastic resource for those you know, people listening. Um, is it through mailing lists that they get involved? Like, how how would do they sign up? Oh no, go to the website and go into workshops, and uh, it's going to tell you when the next workshop is. And you email us, and you can get right in the queue. Uh, you can submit your pages, and actually, part of the reason that we do the the workshops and and submit the pages and have people submit the pages is I firmly believe that everybody needs to have their words read to them uh, by people. Even if you don't think that they're the greatest actors in the world, you should be forced to listen to your script in a room or some sort of setting where you can't pause it. Yeah. Um, Just to like, literally like, Oh, this thing is not in my head anymore. There's an audience here. You're going to see things and be far more critical of that after going through that and listening to your words and I guarantee you the movie you end up shooting eventually after having that experience will be light years better because you were forced through the excruciating process of listening to it in a room with other people, you know, and, and yeah. just having to sit there. Yeah, daunting, but necessary. The necessary evil of our, our world, I think. Um, as the... But look at it this way, though. Yeah. Really think about it, though. Isn't it better to have it in a room full of, like, people that like it's not living on the it's not a completed thing yet versus put it going through all of this work yeah and then putting it out there and not having done the research absolutely and hopefully you're in a supportive setting you know at the same time when you're like you know reading it at the beginning like this to kind of trial and error it and I think you guys are creating that so that's so wonderful um earlier you had mentioned that you got a grant at one point and I want to tap into that because we just talked about kind of getting started and, you know, don't, you know, spend a lot of money for the first five films until you kind of really have an eye or you really have your gut feeling there and you kind of understand the roles. Do you know much about grant writing or how people get started for funding that's beyond asking for personal investment and things like that when they are willing to, you know, start to go out and fund their film? So we got it through school. Like we went through NYU, applied to NYU's grants. He got lucky and, you know, it kicked off from there. So we got very lucky. Um, I think the way to get grants, though, is typically through uh, message films or activist films at this point. It's going to be very hard to do it uh, for a narrative, you right. know, or or just a random thing. You're going to have to have some kind of key message and that has some sort of endowment or something associated with it. And then you're going to go say, my movie's about this. So I'm going to look for these charities or these, you know, funds that are supporting this. And then you're going to apply for that grant. So it's going to be a pre-existing grant that invests in in those types of movies. That's where you're going to have your best chance. Um, And that's why uh, if you're looking for funding and all of that stuff, uh, doing it super cheap, on weekends with your friends to get a couple scenes in place to really hone uh, the, like to make it as inexpensive as possible. And at a certain point, even shoot a sizzle reel that you can raise based on this, you know, when you do a crowdfunding campaign, the more coherent and tight your uh, crowdfunding video and campaign is and all of the stuff that you're doing, the more likely it is to be successful. So, you know, grant writing is really for cause based, I think, cinema for the most part you can get lucky uh but you know it's um also it's very hard and the applications typically are very painful so that's the a lot of uh a lot of charities go around literally their entire they just go they professionally raise funds and then very very rarely are able to like do the mission of the charity so they're so busy raising money and that's going to be what happens for filmmakers and grants you know and that that sort of thing other countries though it's different if you were in another country internationally 
they're really, really good to filmmakers and they yeah. have lots of grants and supportive economies for that sort of thing. So yeah. um, my real advice is be born elsewhere, I guess. Yeah. Um, As a Canadian, I can attest to this um, because the Canadian Film Council has some incredible grant programs um, year round. So that's so wonderful. And I also have been telling everyone because I used to um, work a lot of the Middle East and I, I worked uh, for a while in Doha, Qatar and the Doha Film Institute is one of the most incredible um, institutes because not only are they supporting local filmmakers and, and having their voices heard, um, but they are also bringing in expats a lot of the time in order to support the education around filmmaking. And so it's just it's so cool to look into kind of like how each industry is is supporting itself. Um, so that's that's awesome. And so I'm glad you mentioned it because, yes, as a Canadian, I have to say Canadians. They have it down to some extent, I guess. Um, totally. You totally do. So your best case scenario is figure out how to get the grant, you know, internationally or partner with someone who's internationally yeah. born. Mm -hmm. And then you can collaborate on that project. So that would be another strategy for success. Yeah. As for those that are listening who have not attended the stuff that you and I are used to going to, like NAB and Cinegear. And I think, did you do like VidCom and Filmscape and all those ones as well? We were just at VidCon. That was an experience. I want to hear about it. I've never been to VidCon. Um, I But I really want to know kind of like if you were to mention all of the trade shows you go to or conferences and the log line of why you would recommend someone going or not going, what would it be? All right. So I'll say I'll just go up and down. NAB uh, is for people who are really interested in professional level video content creation you want to know what the state of the art is what everyone's doing what the like the who's who all the booths you want to deep dive into the tech uh nab and ibc which is in uh europe are your best bets mm -hmm. uh ces is less i mean it's more gadgety so it's it's a lot about gadgets so you're going to get a real sense of what the like everything that's going on uh, but it's not going to be content creation specific, right? So if you're really interested in pro uh, filmmaking, I actually think the best, you know, trade show for actually like professional filmmakers is 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 Cinegear, believe it or not, because uh, especially because it was at the lot this year, which versus the uh, convention center, yeah. when it's on the Paramount lot. Yeah, it's really you're going to all the important key vendors are there, you know, in the content creation space. And it's very, very focused. NAB can be like a giant like mess, you know, that that is yes. like whereas Cinegear, I think, has the best bang for your buck for the average person who's really interested in content creation. We have to wrap things up, but I do want to ask. So in addition to. um smartphones is it smartphone studio.tv yeah yeah so in addition to smartphone studio.tv where else can we find you and we make movies and owc and everyone all right so with my owc and gear hat on uh owc.com is the place for all of owc products but we also have an e-commerce retailer called maxsales.com mm -hmm. so uh which basically is everything in the mac ecosystem that's max sales that is the the best place to buy stuff owc.com will give you more of a sense of company and products and things along those lines our instagram is uh powered by owc and uh and then on the we make movies side it's we make movies.org do not go to .com that's the central place you know to find us you know if you are a production who's looking to save money on insurance and uh, have your production run better, faster, smoother, or get some gear recommendations or come participate in a workshop. You know, our, we make uh, our Instagram is at we make movies. Uh, that's, that's us there. And then smartphone studio TV is the sort of the mobile filmmaking side of cool. what we do. And uh, you know, one of those three places that's, that's all me, you know, awesome. and we'll depends see you on which hat I'm wearing. Yes, and we'll see you at NAB and Cinegear. So for those that are coming next year, definitely stop by the OWC booth so that you can see Sam. Um, Sam, thank you so much for joining us on the CFA podcast. And I look forward to having you introduced on our socials um, as an ongoing thing at every every venue we go to. We can probably just like drop in and say hey to you. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. 
hey, this was awesome. And thank you for having me. And you all ever need anything or if anyone ever has any questions too on the, uh, you know, filmmaking side for anything actors are doing, uh, you know, we're, we're very, the struggle is real. We're very familiar with it. We've had countless actors come through over the years trying to level up as producers and filmmakers and create the careers they want. So uh, any way we can help, you know, we're always happy to. Great. We love to hear it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we'll see you soon. Join us in bridging the gap between talent and crew. Start by subscribing on your preferred podcast platform. Sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on vendor discounts, community events, and new podcast releases, and educate yourself through our free course releases on YouTube. It all starts at cinematographyfractors.com. And if you like this episode, consider leaving a review to make it easier for other listeners to find us.